I don't want to be arrogant enough to say it's better than fish and chip shop that you can find in the UK, because there are a lot of people who would disagree with that and at me for that, but I'm proud of the version of fish and chips we've created here, and I think it stands up to the test. So I start on my day at eight o'clock, get to the restaurant, unlock everything, open up the doors. Ah, oh, home sweet home. Woo. Smells like fried fish still. <laughs> that's, that's our life. Patricia is my partner in business and life, which I, I think is the cutest way of saying that. I'm like the window dressing, if you will, but she's like the backbone to the restaurant. All right, let's make some fish and chips. Hello. Top of the morning, Sherry. Hey, good How morning. How the fish delivery, Sherry from Leaper and Sons, who drops it off. Awesome fishmonger to work with. She'll bring whatever she has that day that's great. Especially now she knows her recipe testing, because we can work with anything. Oh, it is heavy. <laughs> that's my workout for the day, though. You got your live lobster, Glidden Point oysters. You got a hake. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. We're gonna make you famous. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> For our fish and chips, we use hake, which is a local flaky white fish. Super delicious. A lot of the cod you get in the east coast of the US comes from Iceland, which is a long way away. And they don't swim. Like, they get caught in Iceland and put on a boat. So the hake is a little more local. We go through a lot of this stuff, like 150 pounds on the two days we do the fish and chips on the weekends. I think the difference between hake and cod is that hake's a little flakier and a little richer in its flesh. Like cod can be a little milder, which is great for some preparations, like if you were cevicheing it or something. But I think for frying, hake holds up a little better. If you're adding something to the deep fryer, you don't really want it to be oily to begin with. You could use oilier fish to, to do fish and chips if you want. Like there's really no rules. You could do pretty much anything, but it works out a lot better. The texture is a lot better with like a flakier, uh, leaner white fish. I think the fish and chips thing came about like almost as an accident. Cause that was the fish and chips was the real pandemic pivot. We've spent the last, what was meant to be like, you know, two, three week pop up. We didn't really know how long it would be. It started last June, 2020 has now turned into like a 10 month gig. We didn't think we'd be selling hundreds of pounds of fish a week. We thought we'd be doing like three or four orders every hour kind of thing. The trick with uh, pin boning, you use like commercial pliers. I will probably get eight orders of fish out of this side and then eight orders out of the other side too. So a total of 16 per fish, but I mean, it really depends on the size of the hate. Zest of a lemon to give it like some aromatic quality. And then the mix of salt and sugar. You like can be quite generous with. We're gonna rinse it off before we fry the fish. It's just, you know, there to draw out some of the moisture in the flesh and then just make sure it's, it's all in. The batter is a version of Heston Blumenthal's recipe. I think every seafood chef, everyone who makes fish and chips seriously agrees that his batter recipe is the best. So this is AP flour goes in. We use sweet potato starch. AP flour alone will not be as crispy. The rice flour makes it really crispy. Rice flour has a lower moisture content and less gluten, well, basically none. Put baking powder in. Beer, important that it's cold, and vodka. A, we make the batter to order, so every time someone orders fish and chips, you make a new batch of batter, because you don't really want to have your fish swimming in hot fry oil. You know, you want it to be steaming inside the crispy batter. And that's like a big part of tempura cooking in, in Japan. Like you don't cook the ingredient, you cook the batter and the ingredient will like poach very gently inside. All right, and it's got to stay cold. Like the flowers starts cold, the vodka's room temperature, but the beer's cold. So the temperature difference when it hits the fryer, just it just speeds up the cooking process. So it's much, much firmer than it was when it was fresh which we want a nice firm piece of uh, fish. Goes straight in the batter, I mean, like no dredge on it. So it just goes straight in. It leaves it like that. You can see how like frothy and bubbly the batter is. It's very important. And at 375, it's gotta be hot. All right, so the batter's like, it's almost like souffléed. It's best not to disturb it so much. Also like cook the fries simultaneously. You test it with a meat thermometer. 
Our busiest days, we do upwards of 100 fish and chips a day, which in those tiny little deep fries is quite a challenge because you fit like two pieces of fish in there at a time, which can be pretty tough. We spent a lot of time trying to make this crispy, right? We'd be ashamed to ruin it at the last minute, but we still want to give it the aroma and flavor of the malt vinegar, so we use a spray bottle. Hey, people in England don't eat that fish and chips that much. Like, it's not a common part of your diet in the UK. So I thought, there's no way it's going to be popular in America. Like, and their response was just overwhelming, straight off the bat. So most of my cooking to this point has been with meat. And now I'm opening my first restaurant as the owner and we decided to cook with seafood. So I'm learning a lot as we go along. So if I get in early in the morning, I can do a bit of recipe development before we open for service, which is really great. So we're gonna test a dish today with these whole lobsters for two. It was, it's meant to be a Dungeness crab dish, but apparently Dungeness crabs don't exist anymore. Oh, they're just too expensive. And we're gonna split them half, devil the tails, bib out of the claws and make a kedgeri out of the knuckles. So one lobster, three techniques. So with the lobsters, we're gonna split them alive down the head and then through the tail, twist the tail off. All right, we're gonna prepare the chili butter sauce for the lobster, a little Dijon mustard. This is a, one of the magic ingredients, like the fermented shrimp and, and chili paste. You get this like Hong Kong supermarket, it has a lot of umami and depth to it. A little bit of smoked paprika too. Just like, like you have some smokiness in the sauce, but also in the in the lobster too from being on the grill. And then some silk chili. All right, grill's hot, so we'll grill the tails. So we cook them shell side down to protect the flesh because it's quite a delicate meat. We don't want to overcook it. So if you do it on the shell side, it'll add a lot of smoke to the lobster, but it will cook the flesh quite gently. So it's gonna take a while. Whereas if we cooked it the other way, it would be like cooked instantly. You wouldn't really have any flavor and it would become rubbery real quick. So it's a little safer. This stuff is like liquid gold. It's like butter and lobster juices accumulating in the head. So these are nearly done. We're gonna finish them in the oven just so we can put a lot of butter on them. We can blanch these claws. The claws come out and into ice water. So we're gonna deep fry. It's like an amazing dish at Wu's Wonton King where they take a whole Dungeness crab, deep fry the whole thing. It has a shell on, but you like bite through the shell and get the crispy bits and then you like suck out the meat. And that's a lot of the inspiration for this dish is that dish in that restaurant. And we'll just crack these with the back of the knife. See, it's still raw on the inside, but like approaching cooked. Take off a bit of the shell so the customer has like an easy time pulling it out once it's been fried. And the claw meat's gonna go into the kedgeri. So whereas you would normally mix in like smoked haddock. Kedgeri is an Anglo-Indian rice dish, uh, normally made with rice, curry powder, hard boiled eggs, and smoked haddock. So we cooked the rice already, like steam it with curry powder, a little saffron, and some bay leaves too, and then season it and then in one of these fancy copper pots. We'll take the heads out and put that in the kedgeri, the tomale. That'll give it a little richness. And that's another part of the animal we wouldn't have been using otherwise. Oh my goodness, I got lobster everywhere. We and Dad have like this joke, like <laughs> if one of us does something silly, we're like, look at each other and be like, don't tell the chef. Because <laughs> like, there isn't really one here. I mean, we both have to do everything. This is Dago, Hi. my heart and soul. So he's like the sous chef, line cook, porter, dishwasher, head chef, delivery driver, like pretty much everything. So that was really the, the drink, the, the straw that stirs the drink kind of thing. All right, lobster's coming out. That's nice and cooked. Let that rest. Balls are done. Finish the rice. A real privilege to be able to use another kitchen for a few months whilst we build out a permanent space next door because oftentimes you take over your new space and you don't have your kitchen ready until a week or two before you open um, and you don't have the time to do that development. So I feel really lucky. Chai some butter, hard to go wrong. Yeah, that actually came out pretty well. Like a lot of times the first thing you make is pretty crap. That looks all right. Like we might end up taking the shell entirely off the claws to make it even easier for the customer to eat, but one animal used three different ways. There are a lot of these seafood restaurants that serve basically sushi or just like cut up raw stuff and then it's not good. Like if you want sushi, go to an omakase place or go to like a real sushi restaurant. 
lobster rolls in New York, not great. So we don't really, we're not gonna cook like the staples of seafood cookery. It's gonna be, I hope to bring a more interesting perspective. I get bored easily, so this is the perfect plate for me with all the different, oh. all the different textures. <laughs> all right. So the monkfish, this is another one I've never tried before, so I have no idea how it's gonna come out, but I think it sounds good on paper. Today, it's gonna to be three techniques on the kebab, but going forward for the restaurant, I think five, if we can source some more monkfish for it. So these are monkfish tails. Uh, we got these from Viking Village and um, Barnegat Light. Unfortunately, a lot of the fishermen discard the heads at sea because you have weight quotas for what you can catch. The heads are weight that you can't really sell for meat. Um, so they toss them overboard. That's something we're trying to change. I'm gonna take the monkfish livers and soak them in salted water to remove some of the blood and some of the sinew before we prep them. Let them sit for an hour or so. Looking good. Nice and fresh, firm. You want some of this, some of these bloody spots too, because it shows it's, it's recently killed and not, you know, decaying and rotten. One of the reasons I like monkfish so much is its texture. It's a very firm fish. People, I think, dismissively call it a poor man's lobster, but it has a, a more unique texture than lobster does. It's much firmer and it holds up really well to grilling. And I you know, wanna be the kind of seafood restaurant where you know, the grill is a central part of the kitchen. And we'll make a meatball. I'm gonna put the tail, an equal quantity of a liver. A little more meat to it, because it's a little loose. I don't want it to fall apart whilst we're cooking it. Okay, that's a good texture for a meatball. Chives and parsley. We'll season it up here too. We want it to be airy and like moussey. I think with seafood more than anything else, you have to really be on top of the technique you're using to cook it in order to make it delicious on the plate. There are a lot of fish that are much better served raw. There are some that are better grilled, some poached very gently, some fish you can deep fry. Like, you would not want to put mackerel in the deep fryer and you do not want to serve uh, hake raw. All right, so you can see with these, like what looked like a very soft and like loose batter has now formed this like a, a nice squidgy little meatball. I think you probably use an ice cream scooper to get like the perfectly round shape, but this is really more just to see whether the flavors work. So I'm excited. We're gonna cut our nuggets. We're gonna season them and then poach them in, a, in an oil that we've uh, infused with garlic and uh, long peppercorns. So this is the, the whole monkfish kebab that we've made a meatball from the liver, put the poached tail on the skewer. It's just been on the grill to warm through. You know, grill and smoke and whole animal utilization, like that's what we're about, so that should be that might be on the menu when we open, six weeks from now, we'll see. We've got six weeks to make it perfect. <laughs>